I'm happy to. I'm, I welcome all questions. Yeah, so um, I noticed that you, uh, one of the first things you said was that the United States was an experiment and that it was the first moral nation and that the DNA of our country is freedom and so on. Um, and I also noticed that you didn't mention that the country was also founded on you know, extermination of the indigenous population, conquest of half of Mexico, and slavery. And, um, you know, and furthermore, I think you have to make a distinction between, while I do love this country, absolutely, I think you have to make a distinction between the internal freedom of the country and the external threat that it poses. And these two things have just been uncorrelated throughout history. So while internally it's the freest country in the world, externally it poses a tremendous threat given its overwhelming power. And I think if you look at the record, it's uncontroversial that our relations with the Middle East have involved extensive violence and aggression and subversion and so on. So my point is that if you are interested in protecting the country from the threat of jihadi terror and Islamic radicalism and so on, I am too. But the point is that by uh, condemning them and pointing out their acts of aggression, uh, to, in my mind, is, is uh, sort of fruitless because there's not very much you can do about it. What you can have an effect on is what we do and our relations with the Arab world. That can have a big effect, and furthermore, we, we can have an impact on that. I don't think history has shown anything. It's that an aroused public can have an impact on policy, which can then lead to much more open and peaceful and diplomatic relations with these you know, outsiders and so on. So isn't that where our energy should be focused? Not towards uh, condemning their radicalism and their violence, over which we can have no effect, except escalating violence, which is likely to just engender more violence in return. Nonsense. How do you really feel? <laughs> it's complete about, uh, nonsense. What you exhibit is a devastating inability to distinguish between right and wrong. And good and wrong. But there's some bad things too. <laughs> but, 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 but really, it's not informing any of your decisions. It's not informing any of your opinions. So what are you suggesting? So you're suggesting that we abandon freedom and we align with radical states that promise to annihilate freedom-loving states in the Middle East to, to what? To achieve peace? Do you really believe that? Can you really deduce that? Does that two and two really equal five? First of all, A, I do not agree with your interpretation. I don't know that I agree with your love of the country, but if you say so, I'll let, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go to how it was founded and why it was founded. It was founded by men, by the way, men and women and families who risked everything. I and mean, when I say risked everything, these were men with names, with wealth, with, 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 with families, uh, not, let's say, you know, murderers like Che Guevara, for example. And I know you wear them on your t-shirt. I so don't get wearing the murderer on your t-shirt. Okay, but wait. These were men who had everything to lose, everything to lose. And they risked everything, and of course their lives, for an idea, for an idea. And the idea was a government, a moral government, based on individual rights. Why do I say moral? Because everything that the Constitution was designed was based upon the extension of individual rights and individual property rights and capitalism. Okay? That was the premise of this country. That was the premise of this country. Now look, we can, you and I can go back and forth on slavery, and I'll probably agree with you, that they made the deal, and there was a lot of fighting at the time. It was southern states and they wouldn't go along, and so a compromise was made, which again, just validates my point that in any compromise between good and evil, evil profits. So a compromise was made, and they were thinking that they would address it later on, just to establish the union. Because they weren't, the South wasn't a capitalist society, it was slavery, I mean it was, it, it was serfdom, is what it was. But the North wasn't, and then, of course, it was reconciled in the worst of ways, or in this case, the best of ways. It's a civil war where hundreds of thousands were killed. Now, are you looking for perfection? I don't see perfection in anything. I don't expect perfection in anything. But I do look for intent, and then, of course, subsequently, the end result. But intent is very important. And I don't believe America ever acted to impose um, uh, an oppressive system. America was the only country that would finally go in finally go in, World War I, World War II, and destroy the enemy, destroy the evil, and I believe it was evil, and then leave. But not before building the country. <laughs> not before, I mean, look at, you want to see a difference in, in, in uh, capitalism versus communism or socialism, look at East Germany and West Germany. West Germany is uh, one of the engines of the world. East Germany was a cancer. Or North Korea and South Korea. 
North Korea is a 30 million gulag. It is a, a, an entire state of, of, of abject poverty and starvation. But they have, the, but they're nuclear. That's the priority for them. So I just disagree. Mm -hmm. I believe, you see, and I know that President Obama thinks much this way also. Um, he, he's, um, you know, like Plato, I believe that peace is a parenthesis. I believe it's the natural state of the world. And I believe that America has been a force for good. I believe that. And so I don't see it the way you see it, going in. I, you know, what, you know, I don't know what you, what you want to do. You want to just be in operation fetal position and just wait for the worst to happen? Do you not think that the worst could happen? I mean, do you take history? Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, we, we, this appeasement, this idea of appeasement. Look, you know, Hitler could be stopped to Czechoslovakia. But it was this idea that, you know what, let's not make waves, let's just, you know, let's just give him what he wants. And, until it got to the point of no return. Until you couldn't stop him. And do I see that happening? I do. I see that happening with Iran. I really do. And believe me, it will not be, uh, there will be no satisfaction for me to come back to you in five years and say, I told you so. Just like when I was writing about Egypt and getting my ass handed to me in January 2011, saying, this is a Muslim brother, this is an Islamic supremacist movement. Now, the young, I'm not saying there were young freedom lovers out there. They had no idea what they were dealing with. But those of us that cover this, we saw it. And it is telling to me that under the Obama administration, you're witnessing revolutions of Islamic imperialism and expansionism. He had moderate Tunisia, just you know, um, in, um, elected an um, Islamic supremacist government, wants the Sharia. You had Libya. Now, I'm not going to shell for Qaddafi. It's not going to happen. But you have a transitional government now that has ties to Al-Qaeda and jih jihadist elements, and they promise a Sharia state. And Egypt, I do not believe we should have thrown Mubarak away with both hands. I don't believe that. And under Bush, if you spoke to Egyptians, and I, am um, of course, in a lot of contact with Egyptian bloggers, it was only after we lost the Congress to Pelosi in 2006, where those reforms stopped being made by Mubarak. You need to know these things. You can't make informed decisions if you don't know. But, 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 but wait, let me just finish. Yeah, no, 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 I just want to finish this one thing about Egypt. Thank you. And then I, I'm happy to the, the, the floor. Um, but it is. If you looked at the elections, the number one winner was the Muslim Brotherhood, and then, of course, even worse, the Salafis. Under Bush, every revolution really was a freedom revolution. The Rhodes Revolution was a real freedom revolution. The, the Cedar Revolution, where they, where they wanted to expel Syria, and they did in Lebanon. That was a real revolution. That was a real freedom revolution. Look, Pamela, all these things can be debated, and they can be debated fairly. Okay. And I endorse what you said at the beginning about the need for a fair and honest debate. What I don't understand, though, is how you square that initial claim with your comment to my student based on a single comment he made that he doesn't understand the difference between right and wrong. How can that comment promote fair and honest dialogue? Okay. How can you make that extrapolation? How can you be a tribune for fair and honest dialogue when you're dealing in rhetoric like that? I was not attempting to deal in rhetoric, and if I insulted the student, I do apologize. No. It just showed to me a complete lack of understanding of right and wrong. And so I had to call it as I see it. <laughs> I had to call it as I see it. You can disagree with me, but that's how I saw it. And again, Professor <coughs> Zimmerman, I will not couch my words to make everybody feel better. I'm not here to do that. And I am sure that you get plenty on a daily basis from the other side. So if I have to give you a shot in inoculation in a, in a half an hour, that's what I'm going to do. Go ahead and call me. Yes, the young lady behind the gentleman. Uh, well, you said that uh, when you defeated the campaign by uh, marginalizing them. Yes. When they pose like immense threats. Well, I mean, it was law enforcement, but I'm saying in the perception, on the, on, in the landscape, the, the psychological landscape of America, they became an abhorrent idea. Just like if I say the name now, what, what comes into your mind? You're like, <laughs> you know. They became an abhorrent, they were not always an abhorrent idea. No, I, I know, I understand. Um, and I'm just saying, I'm asking if um, we were to marginalize, like, the jihadists in America or the Muslims in America that, you know. We, we do not want to marginalize the Muslims in America. That would be, that would be terrible. That would be making everybody pay. It's like, you know, everybody pays because one person. No, 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 no. But you have to identify what the threat is, what's motivating, and what's the inspiration or ideology that's, that's motivating. Okay, then I'm just confused about what your end goal is. Like, what do you, what's your end goal for, like, you no, know, like, Muslim relations in America? I'm just confused about I, I, Again, with that Muslim relations in America, I feel bad when I hear that. As if they're separate.
separate. Why do they have to be separate? We're all Americans. They come here to live and, and, and love and have families and work. Uh, why does it have to be separate? Why? I don't understand that. I, I, I just want you to know I can never go there. I won't ever go there. There is a problem with a very pure Islam, very authentic, pure, you know, third chapter, you know, offensive jihad. There's a problem with that. I don't believe that. I, I believe most Muslims are secular. I don't believe that most Muslims want to commit jihad. I, I just don't. And that's my premise, that most people are good. So just so that you know. Did, I, did you finish your question or did I keep interrupting? Oh, no, I'm done. Okay. Uh, yes, sir? So um, you, the terminology that you used is to call it the Ground Zero Mosque. But since Park 511 isn't a mosque, it's a community center, and it has a culinary school, food court, swimming pool, basketball court, movie theater, and it's not on Ground Zero, it's near it. I'm wondering what is the radius that the uh, Muslim community is not allowed to build a community center in? What would you say? It's, it's a mosque with amenities. I mean, it's, it's a... It's a mosque. Story, right? It's a mosque, two, two, top two floors. It's a mosque with amenities. And the fact that that building was destroyed in the attacks on 9-11 makes it ground zero. Do you really think that Osama bin Laden, when he was planning the 9-11 attacks, the two planes you go in, that he really thought that the buildings would fall the way they fell? Didn't you think he hoped to take out Lower Manhattan? Would anybody have understood that the heat from the planes would have melted those columns? There was no way of knowing that. I mean, he was shocked. He wasn't that shocked. And so, uh, clearly, I, they could build it anywhere else. They could put that as long as that building was destroyed in the 9-11 attacks. It should have been declared a war memorial. It should have been a landmark. It should be a shrine to the over 270 million victims of over a millennium of jihadi wars, land appropriations, cultural annihilations, and enslavements. Not that building. That was really, just so that you know, it is ground zero and it is a mosque. Then they said, it's not a mosque, it's a prayer space. A prayer space is a mosque. They play, it's a, it's a word game. Then on, you know, it was Cordoba, Cordoba, Cordoba. Then when it was exposed on television by myself and others, what Cordoba means, on Monday it was Cordoba, and on Tuesday it was Park 51, and nobody questioned it in the media. The media wanted that mosque, they did. Um, I have no problem with mosques. That mosque was, uh, you know, was deeply um, offensive and, and humiliating. You know. So that's my answer to your question. Yes? Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Uh, my question actually ties into the previous one, which is about your work. Um, I see that you were involved as a producer in a movie, a documentary called The Ground Zero Mosque, Second Wave of 9-11 Attacks. I was curious to hear your thoughts on that and how the phrasing of that title, you know, how did you, what was the process by which you came about that? And would you rephrase that title if you had the opportunity? Would you, you know, well, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. It's a very good question, actually. I've never been asked that before. Um, the, uh, Ground Zero Mosque, yes, because that's what it is. Second wave of the 9 11 attacks, how that came to me was at one of the landmark hearings early in the fight, one of the 9-11 family members, Rosaline Talon, who lost her only brother, a beloved brother, got up to speak to the, to the, to the committee. And as she was speaking, there were agitators in the audience that started to scream at her, racist, bigot. And I thought, oh my god, look at this woman. She lost her only sibling, brother that she loved and adored. I mean, she actually gave me a CD with him, you know, on playing with the pipes. Um, and she stands up for what she believes in at a hearing, which, by the way, we, we lost. Lost them all. Because the politicians wanted it, and the mayor wanted it, and President Obama wanted it. And she's being attacked again. And every single 9-11 family member that opposed it was being attacked again. And then when the CNN poll came out saying that 70% of the Americans were against it, 70% of the Americans were racist, Islamophobic, anti Muslim bigots. And this was an attack. This was another attack, a stealth jihadi attack, in the information war, in this battle space. And that's how I saw it. And that's what the movie is about. The movie is, and I have a copy, I'll leave with you. I know how you probably love to show it to your class next year. Um, uh, <laughs> 
Uh, it's yours. It's yours. It's a gift. Um, but, but I wanted people to understand how it happened. You've been hearing one thing and one thing only from the media. I mean, you had NBC News name Sharif Algamal the person of the year, the NBC person of the year. Here's a man who defaulted on not one $100,000 loan, but two, $200,000 loans, did not pay his rent, so her property, was evicted, um, had the audacity to say, it's not ground zero. It's not ground zero, it's not ground zero. And yet applied for $5 million from the ground zero rebuilding fund, the 9-11 fund. I mean, and he had a rap sheet, you know, there's a, there, I'm not gonna get into the, the it's not. He wasn't an architect, that would be Mohammed Khan. Yeah, <laughs> no. No, but, but the, the, the developer, Sharif al -Gamal. and he's NBC Man of the Year. Why? Solely because he proposed this. It was, it was outrageous. So everything the media said was demonizing. There was no presentation of objective reporting. And this is what I think is sorely lacking from the landscape, absolutely and completely, is objective reporting. Just the facts, of which there really was not. So I think that your, your, your um, uh, much of information <coughs> is uh, skewed. And it's, it's, it's biased, not by your own fault, but it should tell you.